I'm a software architect. I'm the founder of iDesign, a company I started uh, 24 years ago, devoted for the sole purpose of nothing but software design. But when we say software design, we mean both system design, what you call architecture, and also project design. Over the years, we've helped hundreds of companies deliver great software and meet their commitments and launch the careers of thousands of architects the world over. Before I designed in the late 90s, I was the chief software architect of a Fortune 100 company in Silicon Valley, where I still reside. And I managed the architecture department. Before that, I was the vision architect. Before that, project architect. Before that, just an architect. I'm well into my fourth decade as a software architect. I published eight books on my ideas and techniques. The recent one is Writing Software. Published more than 100 articles, speak at conferences all over the world. I never worked for Microsoft, but I was privileged to be part of the strategic design effort of key products like C Sharp and WCF. Quite a few of my ideas made it into the products. I had some of the most fundamental breakthroughs in modern software engineering idea like microservices are mine, but I had several other ideas far more important. Microsoft recognized me as a software legend, something they only gave to six people so far due to the impact they had on the industry over the years. Onboarding is typically something that you do in the front end uh, with the initial batch of developers, but you may have to onboard developers as you phase them into the project as well. Sadly, onboarding is often haphazard and unstructured. And we already discussed the fact that the predominant technique for onboarding is the new guys just go and drain effort from key team members, especially those on the critical path, because there's obviously the best developers. In addition, when people onboard in this unstructured way, they tend to do it again and again and again. So every time you onboard somebody, all the waste is again and again and again, asking the same silly question from the same guy just by a different person. This is obviously a great waste. It's also very inefficient. It's not good for the people you onboard. It's not good for the people that are doing the onboarding. In addition, because it's non-structured, you actually depend on the well uh, wishes and good meaning of everybody involved. You depend on the developers having enough curiosity to go and investigate certain topics and learn. Uh, you depend on them actually not deluding themselves that, oh yeah, we already know that, uh, let's move on, right? No, maybe they think they understand something and they don't. It depends on them not having too many delusions. Oh, I'm so good at this, I don't need to learn anything new. It depends on people having enough time to actually go and onboard other people. And as a result, often when you onboard people, the hidden gap and misconception, and you are going to discover that at the worst possible moment. Because sometimes later, they're going to do their best effort, and unfortunately, their best effort is not going to be enough. You're going to say, why is he doing this and not that? And they would say, well, nobody explained to me it has to do this and not that. In addition, developers tend to neglect the boring aspects of the onboarding. They tend to focus on shiny little toys and not on foundational things. And if you go and do some uh, post-mortem, if you go and investigate problems, you will many times find that it was simply got to do with a less than, uh, less than perfect onboarding. Definitely, uh, we see lack in quality training, how to properly uh, understand things, how to properly run the life cycle. And there's often missing qualifying training, meaning nobody ever trained him to do this particular role they need to do. They did similar things, but not this particular thing, right? And the only way to solve it is to design the onboarding process itself. Now, the best way of doing it is if it's unstructured, then structure it. You start by listing categories of knowledge developers should know. And this is 
a partial list, you can add things to this list. Every project has some or most elements on this list. Developers need to understand the domain. I cannot stress it enough how important it is for developers to understand the domain. Developers add the most value when they understand the domain. Developers get promoted when they understand the domain. It's good for their career to understand the domain. Nobody cares about technology, by the way. But if they don't understand the domain, bad things happen. Developers have to understand the software design. Now, you don't expect developers to be able to come up with a design in the first place. But to be able to understand why we have this architecture, what are the various components doing and such, they have to do it. Even if they're going to be working on one component over here, they have to understand the context of that component. Developers have to understand the system requirements. What is this business for? What are we here for? Are we here because it's cool and interesting or because we have a mission? Therefore, what is the mission? What are the requirements? What at the very least are the core use cases? I know you only care about this thing over here, but when you encounter something that contradicts something else, you need to know about that. They have to understand the detailed design. Now, again, I don't expect developers to, to come up with detailed design. Um, disillusion in that regard. But to be able to understand why we have this data design, why this and not that, why it's not a good, a good idea to couple it from here to there, absolutely they need to understand. They certainly need to understand all the data design pertaining to what they need to interface with, meaning that component over there and that service over there and whatever. If you have a framework that you use, and most projects today have a framework, the framework is where you get the the platform level things, your transaction, your security, your message handling, your message pass, your pub sub, your diagnostic, your instrumentation, your tracing, all of that good stuff is in a framework. Well, they're going to have to make use of it. So are they going to figure it out by doing it? No. Train them on how to do it. Developers have to understand the technology. Technology moves along at a phenomenal pace. Every new version of C-Sharp, there's new features, there's new this. Every new version of AWS, there's 20 different features. Okay, are they going to figure it out? Most importantly, they have to understand your process and your culture. Here's how we do things here. Here's like the 10 commandments of this project. Here's what we don't tolerate. We don't tolerate uh, defects, for example. We don't tolerate code that doesn't comply with the standard. You have to train them on the SDD. It's sad that I have to explain what an SDD is. SDD is a software design document. And the SDD captures everything there is to know about the software modules, all the public interfaces, all the data contracts, interaction diagrams. Here's how we do something over here. Without an SDD, what's the point of doing an architecture? Seriously, what's the point? If the architecture is all about long-term cost of maintenance and maintainability, how do you expect people to maintain your code Without documentation, you expect them to just go and read the code and figure out what it does. Even that is probably not going to do it because in many systems today, there is no way of inferring what the system is doing by looking at the code. I wish we could. It's all these magic things that happen in between and this and that, and it comes from this queue, it goes there. Where is that? You have to have these things in the STD. You have to have context map that shows the execution context of the various components. You have to explain what the handoff point is. If they are expected to do digital design, then you have to train them on digital design. If they're not, then they are forbidden from doing digital design. Here's the design you already have, or work with that person over there on it. Of course, you have to onboard them on the standard. Here's how we code. Here's how we design. Explain how you do reviews. Most people don't do reviews. They think they do. They call it code reviews. It's not code review. It's code walks through. It's, you know, you have a projector, you bring it up, you scroll, 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 you yap, yap, yap. No, reviews needs to be formal. You have reviewers, you have a scribe, you have a moderator. Before the meeting, you assign the things to review. They all review the code before. In the meeting, you review the comments, you consolidate them. You have reports, who is doing what, how do we fix things, okay? They've never seen it. They have to train them how to do it. How do we do DevOps? I mean, is it just F5 or is it 220 steps of configuring the system before you can do the most basic uh, debugging? What does that do? How do you do it? Who owns it? Who owns these system scripts? Do you have system analyzers that 
Do static code analysis and prevent people writing offensive code? Yes, no. How do you override it if you need to? Are you allowed to override it? What level of warning is okay? And on and on and on, right? These are all things they have to know, and you have to impart this knowledge on them. These are, are just top-level categories. You can add additional categories that make sense, like, you know, compliance or fraud detection or whatever it is that, that's specific for your project. Now, for each one of these categories, you identify sub-elements. How many? I would say three to 10, no more, no less. If there's only one or two things you have to say about a category, it's not really a category. Lump it somewhere else in another category. If it's more than 10 things, break it into two separate categories. It's too big. Now, for each element, you assign an owner or two, but no more than that. What does it mean? Whenever they have a question during the onboarding in a particular element, they don't go and bother anybody except the owner. And if you have a lot of people to onboard, then it's probably a good idea to have the owner of those things not even assigned any coding activity. That person serves as a lightning rod for everybody to go and discuss these things, right? They don't bother anybody that's actually doing anything useful. And they're not allowed to approach a non-owner of a topic. And if they do, that person should politely say, I'd like you to talk to Joe about that. That's it. Redirect them to the owner. For each element, you also estimate how much time they need to spend on it. So if you estimate it as two hours and they spend 20 minutes on it, obviously they underdid it. And if you estimate it in two hours and they spend two days on it, obviously either you grossly underestimated the element or there's a gaping hole here you need to fix. So it's very important to see the correlation here. In addition, per developer, you track their progress. It's very simple. Here's the all effort estimation across all elements. That's 100%. Here's how many hours you spent so far. I expect to be 100% by this date. Okay, it's just like end value tracking. Exactly. It's also a good idea to compare. So if you have three or four developers you're onboarding, they can actually see on some kind of a scoreboard which where everyone is with respect to the onboarding. Right? And somebody can see if they're uh, left behind. And it's important for them to know that behind it's important for you monitoring it to say, okay, this developer is not catching up on the onboarding like the other guys. Okay, what's going on? After the onboarding, which is mostly self-study, okay, you'll see in a second what it means. These things typically they do on their own. If they have questions, they go to the uh, owner, but it's not like the owner's job to teach them. All of this is self-study. After the onboarding, you engage in in-person live sessions with the architect and the subject matter expert. So the architect is the one that deals with framework design, detailed design, process, all of that goodness. Subject matter expert deals with the domain issues. And remember, the most important thing for them to learn is actually the domain. And you do two types of live sessions. You do group session and individual. The purpose of these meetings is to identify the remaining gaps so that you can see what else you need to do, but also send them a message. You will be sort of tested on this at the end, and it's on the fourth of the month where you have to be ready with that onboarding. Look, it's work. They have to do it. And also, if you see something that all of them are missing, then it's already nobody's individual fault. It's your fault. You have to refine the process, either add something, add more material in a particular element and such. Now, sometimes they ask you questions and they all always ask the same question. You say, okay, uh, that wasn't part of the material we provided you. So uh, yeah, we'll fix it next time. When it's time to onboard, in order for this to be self-study, Documentation is key. So you have to document in the STD, you have to document the context map, you have to document the APIs, you have to document how you use the framework. All of these things is good things to do in general, but it's absolute gold when it's come to onboarding. Now, if in the front end you did a lot of design meetings and you debated and you decided on this and that, it's a good idea to record those meetings and have them be available as part of the future onboarding. 
And in the project I just mentioned to you several times, I even had one top guy transcribe the meetings. Now, there's actually good uh, features today that do automatic transcription, but, you know, it misses something. So somebody needs to go over there and fix uh, uh, some of the words that they get wrong, and, and it's not an I, ah, it's an and, and, and all of that. So it's a good idea to have the meeting recording or even the transcription next to them. So here's what an onboarding pen looks like. This is from the actual project I keep referring here. And what do we see here? We see here uh, five, actually today there's seven different categories. Here we see domain uh, in general. Here we see specifics on the domain. Here we see software design in general. Here is software design specific for the system. Here's about the system requirement. Here's about the technology. And if I were to actually take a screenshot of this uh, um, spreadsheet completely, you wouldn't be able to even see these captions up. But trust me, there's another 50% of this going down. For each one of these things, you can see a link. This link is either to a recording of a meeting or a document or a YouTube clip or a lecture or a blog entry, or a book, whatever it is, they click, they have the information. Here you have the effort estimation for each. Here you have the mentor assigned for each item. Now remember, they're only allowed to go to the mentor or the owner. Here is the tracking. Here they report how much they spent on each. And this is actually the uh, effort spent in hours. And here we have the zero and one, zero and one for the value that they earned. And somewhere in here on the other tab, it's actually the graph of their progress. Now, very important that you impart on them the following impression. Onboarding is not the sum of learning. The aim of onboarding is to kickstart the onboarding, to kickstart the domain knowledge, the technology knowledge, and so on. The whole purpose of onboarding is to structure and condense it and reduce the interference to the other team members. That's all it's about, okay? And so you say, we do this for you, but then this whole thing is aiming at kickstarting the effort. What is kickstarting the effort? Often or not, they're gonna come into any topic, be it domain or technology or design with some misconception. So you dispel the misconception, put them on a, common uh, uh, platform. You provide the primer. Everyone needs to know at least this. You point at the areas of expertise that it's important for you to uh, that they know. You set the expectation. I expect you to know at least this, but once you start working, I expect you to keep learning on that. Also, it's important that they establish a rapport with domain experts because once they're done with learning the framework and the technology and such, all added value is by understanding the domain. Now, since they're not domain experts, they have to work with domain experts. And that means they have to go and nag and pull on the sleeve and send the emails and, and call. Well, if you don't know that person, yeah, I don't want to impose, I'll just go and Google it. And that's the end of it, right? So if during the onboarding, they interact with domain experts and such, then they feel less intimidated to approach them later. Also, between you and me, the domain expert can report you and say, that guy over there, amazing with the domain, give them more, or that guy over there, I don't know. The developers must continue the journey. Again, the onboarding is not the sum of the learning. It's the beginning. Onboarding is a continuous effort. It never stops. This is especially true with the domain. In all serious business uh, domains, it never stops. There is a reason why there's somebody whose full-time job is to know the domain, okay? And so I don't expect them to learn how to be better programmers by much, but being domain expert, that's a lifetime vocation. After the onboarding, you can engage in what I call domain cutters. Domain cutters are short weekly sessions conducted by domain experts. Each kata poses a question. Now, good katas are questions 
which they cannot Google. Think about that for a second. And so, obviously, they can Google, but then it's the wrong answer. Well, that would be nice. Or she would say they cannot Google the right answer. And the purpose of the domain kata is to force developers to research. And if the answer is searchable, it's not a good kata. What you're trying to do is trying to build the fundamental foundational knowledge. You're trying to ask questions about katas that understanding that would add the most value for them and for the business. Katas should also cover market differentiators. Well, everybody in this business is doing it like this, but we are doing it like that, and here's why. Or maybe business trends. The trend today, everybody's doing it like this, but the industry as a whole has already agreed it needs to move uh, over there to deep uh, whatever. Okay? All of that are good material for katas. And you need to track the participation. You need to track the interest. If developers don't participate in the katas, that's a bad sign. That's the, okay. Why not improving your knowledge? If you're the person that uh, don't doesn't like this domain, then this is the wrong job for you. If you're the person that doesn't like learning period, this is also the wrong job for you. Okay. So you want to track the participation. Um, I wouldn't do a thousand of these. I would do, you know, 15, 20 and such. That's probably enough to uh, keep the knowledge going. What you're trying to do is constantly try and spice it up and make them go and acquire additional knowledge and additional knowledge. Here's an example of from the project I keep referring to of domain cutters. So this is just a subset, okay? Because if I were to show everything here, we wouldn't be able to see anything. But... You can see this is this is maybe there's maybe a hundred pages here or whatever, and you can see uh, uh, a lot of domain knowledge and links and comparing things and charts and everything else, right? So I think here you see about a dozen cutters. I think overall there's about fifteen, okay? And each one of them it takes a week because you give them some time. You give, you pause the question, then you give them the time to go and do the research, then they submit the answers. Then a domain expert critique those answers and contrast them and explain what they got wrong. Then you provide the right answer and then you do it again the following week. Okay. So they also need to spend the time doing it. And that's fine because that's becoming better at the domain. Once you have done your series of cutters, you add that to the onboarding. So now part of the onboarding is the new guys have to go through the cutters themselves in a self-paced way. Okay, so you spend a lot of time also editing this document to make it uh, passable by everybody else.